Here follows an extract from my book Letters from the Broom Cupboard, available from Amazon. Dear reader, after decades of entertaining pupils of all shapes and varieties, I've developed something of a sixth sense. It's a common trait in all established music tutors. My friend, May, reckons that she can smell trouble from the briefest telephone inquiry and can quickly discern that her books are quite full at the moment, despite the fact that the inquiry is the direct result of a recent advertisement for pupils. She taught me well, and I now possess something of her powers. There are many telltale signs which, although quite innocent in isolation, once combined together signal impending doom. Learning to discern the signs is rather more art than science, although some of the earliest harbingers of trouble are quite simple. Once your attention is around, you just have to follow the verbal trail of breadcrumbs and adjust as the path unfolds. There are certain standard inquiry openings that suggest calamity lies ahead. I won't ever make her practice, I'll just let her play what she wants to play when she chooses. This is a sure sign of lurking doom. If I only ever played when I felt like it, I'd still be on three blind mice. I never much fancied learning to do maths. If I'd been left to my own devices, I'd now be blissfully unaware of what fees were actually due or being paid. Fortunately, my parents and teachers forced me to learn how to add up, so it's thanks to them that I won't now get ripped off. I still say I'd rather have stayed sitting in front of the clangers all night. Another classic signal of impending disaster is I just don't want to learn any scales or stuff like that. I just want to be able to improvise and play jazzy stuff. Well, now then, it seems that we are locked in something of an impasse before we've even met. Silly me. I'll just go and find my pot of magic dust and that'll sort it. I won't be long. It must be here somewhere. The classic one-liner that endures throughout the mists of time is I'm not buying an instrument until I see if he's got it. If he takes to it, then we'll think about it. Such a relationship is ill-fated from square one. In the first instance, I suspect that it's socially taboo to dare to ask precisely what it actually is. I have a sneaky feeling that I'll be searching for that pot of magic dust again, although I never can seem to lay my hands on it. Putting it to one side, I hardly dare ask how anyone will ever take to music if they only get to play for a maximum of 30 minutes per week. I was obviously a very slow-witted student as I foolishly spent the bloom of my youth playing scales and Schumann for hours on end before I could get it. Perhaps it's only the feeble few who need to practice or to work and rework small sections of notes and fingering. I guess that we'd better swap seats while they liberally sprinkle me with the fairy dust that they obviously own. I still can't find my pot. I've mentioned before that it may not be feasible for everyone to purchase a full-sized acoustic piano and it appears that not many are willing to accommodate a free-to-a-good-home one for aesthetic purposes. But you do need to show a modicum of good intent. A keyboard will do for starters at least. This dilemma is particularly prevalent in would-be piano students but it isn't wholly exclusive to the keyboard genre. I regret to inform you that I have experienced inquiries for flute lessons when the potential pupil doesn't own their own flute. The audacity of a complete stranger thinking that they can manhandle my open hold flute, presuming that their finger shape will actually cover the keys, which is an anatomical lottery outside of anyone's control, is bad enough. Take the process a logical step further and consider the audacity of presuming to spit into my solid silver lip plate before handing back to me to demonstrate the next point, which is a bacterial lottery that I am fully in control of. They have a wealth of musical disappointments stacking up on the not too distant horizon, I can sense it. Learning the embouchure and diaphragm control to actually sound a note on the flute can take some getting used to. How can anybody expect to achieve any progress with only ad hoc access to somebody else's flute, though certainly not mine, once a week? It's beyond comprehension. 
as you can imagine, such phone calls are of very short duration. Over time, my powers of psychoanalysis have developed further than these brief forays into potential pupil divination, and I have honed the ability to assess the personality type of a student by interpreting their performance style. Again, this is a subtle art, and, although I'm rarely wrong, there are times when an unexpected factor skews the hypothesis. Confidence is always a huge bonus when playing any instrument, and a more gregarious personality will happily bash away at their music with little regard for my long-term hearing and with absolutely no regard whatsoever for any wrong notes. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. Oversensitivity to playing wrong notes can be really disabling to a student's progress. The main issue here is when it's a case of misplaced confidence. Tammy has oodles of confidence and attacks the keyboard with relish. It's just a pity that she has no perception or no concern about where she actually places her fingers. This is a general character type and they're often really pleasant people. They just don't listen. Such a temperament often goes hand in hand with an inflated sense of their own ability and at the same time as ignoring the sound their own fingers are making, they often ignore the words that I speak. It can be tricky to initially gauge a student's ability. Without wanting to put anybody to the test, it's inevitable that at some point I'll have to give them a piece of music to attempt. So as to minimise embarrassment, I couch finding their levels in phrases such as How would you feel about looking at this? Or Does this look much too easy? My intent is to give them the opportunity to say something like No, that doesn't look easy at all. Or I'm not sure how I'd feel about playing this music. I hope that this is better than making them feel a complete chump as they stare blankly at the music and the piano keyboard. However, this system fails with the overconfident student who will tell me that they can play whatever I put in front of them, but are then utterly clueless when asked to attempt the exercise. The flip side of this situation is the pupil who is far too self-effacing. Their reticence is absolutely no reflection on their ability, but more an indicator of their retiring personality. This student will tend to play every piece of music pianissimo, issimo. This is usually paired with an insistence to play everything at a funereal pace, even after months of consistent practice. The fear of making even a small mistake robs them of what would be a musical performance, if they dared to just go for it. Such a lack of confidence is a real inhibitor to progress. Even in an exam, a student will gain much better marks for a lively and varied performance, even with some wrong notes, although the goal is always not to have too many of these. A performance of merely accurate notes, but played as a dull mathematical exercise, is lifeless and uninspiring. If only I could mash these two personality types together. The confidence of the one mixed with the application and accuracy of the other would be a perfect combination. However, as I mentioned earlier, I have been known, on occasion, to misinterpret the stereotype, although I'm wise to the situation now. For years I'd presumed that pupils like Debbie were cautious and timid because of how quietly they played. No amount of encouragement would convince them to apply a bit of welly when they played. After much of the same encouragement, I did what was the only sensible thing to do. I asked Debbie in a straightforward manner why she played so quietly all of the time. Her answer was as simple as it was shocking. Her piano was in the same room as the TV and her dad got cross if she played too loudly. The wonder now was that she ever played at all. Why would her father pay for lessons and then buy her a piano to then place it next to the TV? If it was so utterly preposterous to consider turning the TV off for half an hour or so, why not place the piano in the hallway or buy an instrument that could play through earphones? Sometimes there are just no words. Gratefully yours. For the full collection of Letters from the Broom Cupboard, available from Amazon in paperback or as an e-book, follow the links in the cards in the description box or find details on my website at SharonBill.com. Thanks for listening.